Forty years ago, Francis Sherwood of Montreal, Canada, was something of a rarity. A single working mother raising her nine-year-old son Clifford alone. Give me another word. Um, prayer. In 1951, Francis's husband had walked out on her, wow. taking her four daughters with him. Right. Hurry up, Slowpoke. We're going to be late. October 21st, 1954, okay. began like any other day for Francis and her son. Don't be late for school. But when Clifford left for school that Hi. morning, it turned out to be the last time his mother ever saw him. Thirty-eight years have passed since Clifford Sherwood's disappearance. Yet his mother still lives in the same house, clinging to the hope that someday her only son will return. The disappearance of Clifford Sherwood is the oldest registered missing child case in Canada. Not surprising, the authorities abandoned their investigation years ago and deemed the case inactive. The natural assumption being that Clifford was dead. However, Frances Sherwood feels certain that her son is still alive and that as a nine-year-old boy, he was kidnapped by his father, Nephi Sherwood. Francis McKiernan met Nephi Tex Sherwood in 1940, while Tex was stationed with the Canadian Army in Ontario, Canada. Less than a year later, they were married. When I first met him, he was a wonderful man. The only thing is, he was much older than I. But other than that, I don't think I could have wished for a more attentive person. It was after we got married that uh, things changed. Over the next five years, Francis and Tex had five children, four daughters and a son, Clifford. But as the children grew older, the marriage began to disintegrate. There's times that he'd decide he was going out drinking with the boys and not come home till 10 o'clock at night and expect his supper Francis. on the table at that time. Where's my dinner? I'll get it. Wait a minute. Why wasn't it on the table? It was on the table. At 6 o'clock when you said you'd be home. How am I supposed to have your dinner ready when I never know when you're going to be home? Shut up! You think I don't know what's going on? You may not be as bright as some of your fancy lovers, but I'm not that stupid. I he seemed to be very jealous of me. He accused me of everything that was going on home. except being away. Well, just stop your sniveling. You hear me? I put up with it because of my children. That's, that's what it was. Go with your fine, educated friends. I always believed that maybe he could get better. And that was my hope in life because I did think an awful lot of him. Otherwise, I think I would have left him in the first year. In 1950, Frances became pregnant once again. Frances? But in her fifth month, she was admitted to the hospital, suffering from a serious abscess. I'm sorry, Frances. I wish I had some alternative. But I have to recommend that you terminate this pregnancy. Terminate. I'm afraid so. With having the five other children, I figured, well, if they take this baby's life, I'll miss it, yes. But it, w it won't be an entirely blank space because I have other children to fill in. But at five months, he would not have much of a chance. The baby was taken from me on the 1st of January, 1951. I told Tex that I could go home. And he said, well, he says, uh, there'll be nobody there to look after you, and I don't know who's going to, because I'm not. On the very day that Frances was released from the hospital, Tex bought her a one-way train to get to stay with her mother in Montreal, where he had already sent Clifford. Tex was determined to keep the other children, but he did allow the couple's oldest daughter, Colleen, to say goodbye to her mother. Where are you going? I'm going to live someplace else. Why? I was really daddy's girl, daddy's you know what I mean? Um, was the oldest. And he just said something about her being sick, and she was going home to her mother's to rest and stuff, and 
you know, maybe later on, maybe later on we would get back together or Mom would come with us or, you know. Colleen, do you want to come with me? No. I don't think so. It made me feel very bad because I was losing part of my life. And that was the last I saw of her for about 14 years, I guess, by the time she was able to come to Montreal to see me. While Frances was on her way to Montreal, Tex packed up their four daughters and moved 3,000 miles away to Vancouver, British Columbia. Four months later, the girls were placed in foster care where they would remain for the rest of their childhoods. Tex was often away from home and had left them in the custody of a housekeeper who was arrested for drug addiction. Meanwhile, on the other side of Canada, Frances was raising Clifford on her own. Tex Sherwood, however, was not completely out of their lives. Tex used to come into town and he'd phone to see if he could see his son and I never refused him except one time when he phoned at 10 o'clock at night. The day Clifford disappeared, it was a beautiful day, and I saw him out the door with his lunch and uh, said, okay, I'll see you later. Just after leaving the house, Clifford ran into his best friend, Butch. The two boys were soon joined by another friend, George Gumbley. When I spoke to Butch, he said that uh, they had met George on their way to school. George and Clifford were stood talking, and Butch said, come on, let's go to school, we're going to be late. You go ahead, we'll catch up. Clifford never got to school, and neither did George. I looked and waited around. About 8 o'clock at night, I phoned the police. And the police said, uh, oh, well, he hasn't been missing 48 hours, so we can't do a thing about it right now. So after that, I went down in the lanes, looked in the lanes, thought he might be under a balcony, scared to come home for some reason or another. And I couldn't find him, and he has never been found, and that's 37 years ago. The police speculated that Clifford had run away from home, but Francis would hear none of it. A year passed. There was no trace of Clifford Sherwood. Then Frances received the phone call she had been dreading. The police had found the lower torso of an unidentified young boy about 100 miles from Montreal. They asked Frances to come to the morgue and sign a statement acknowledging that the remains were Clifford's. We believe it's a male, roughly nine years old. And the remains have been there over a year. Is there a problem, Miss Sherwood? Do I have to accept that this is my son you're showing me? No, ma'am. It's not Clifford. Excuse me? All he did was it's just read me son. what they had found, didn't show me nothing, and I said, no, that's not my boy. I just had that feeling that it's a feeling I can't explain to anybody, but it just went right through my body and told me no. Frances believed that her ex-husband, Tex Sherwood, had been responsible for Clifford's disappearance. When questioned by police, Tex disavowed any knowledge. For the next eight years, he maintained contact with his four daughters. It was obvious, however, that Clifford was not to be discussed. He would literally drop the subject. And if we tried to get it back to where we were and get him going again on it, he would just get absolutely wild. And I mean wild. He'd smash a wall, smash a TV, smash anything. Like, you know, you knew enough to leave it alone. Just drop it. Then in 1962, Tex Sherwood dropped completely out of sight. Fourteen years later, he resurfaced in a rundown hotel in Chilliwack, British Columbia. When Colleen paid her father a surprise visit, she made an unsettling discovery. Hi. Could you give me the room number for Mr. Sherwood, please? Mr. Nephi Sherwood? No, Mr. Sherwood here. I beg your pardon? Colleen discovered that Tex was registered at the hotel under the name Edward Thorne. Later that day, 
he confessed that he had used that name while serving in the army. He said, I did go into the First World War. Um, I was a bit too young to join. I was only 14 at the time. So he said, I used my neighbor's name. He said, so I could get in. And, and uh, they accepted that and accepted his birth certificate. And because of my DVA pension, I have to stick to this, this name now. In 1987, Tex Sherwood, a.k.a. Edward Thorne, died, taking to his grave any knowledge he may have had about Clifford's whereabouts. Colleen and Francis now believe that Tex may have used his double life to create a new identity for his son. Four years after Tex died, Colleen was cataloging the letters and pictures which had accumulated over the years. Two photos in particular caught her attention. I found a picture of Clifford and my father, and I sat there and I stared at it, and I stared at it, and he's definitely older than the nine years old he was when he was disappeared from Montreal. I didn't recognize the clothes, and he seemed a bit bigger than what he had done when he was left home. I would say it could have been taken six months, maybe a year after he had disappeared. What can I do for you? I'm looking for information on my father. Colleen contacted the Department of Veteran Affairs, but was not allowed to examine her father's file. I can backtrack on him. Maybe I can locate my brother. Okay. They did a computer print off of the information that they had, and I sort of leaned over at the desk slightly and uh, was trying to read it upside down, and I noticed my father had written down that he had never been married. And had no dependents. I'm afraid I can't even give you this information. Colleen was informed that because she did not prove that Edward Thorne was her father, his military records must remain sealed for 20 years after his death. In this case, the year 2006. In the meantime, the Sherwood family has no choice but to wait and wonder about Clifford. To me, a family is almost like a picket fence. Um, you know, when somebody comes on and Mark knocks a board down, there's that big hole, um, if nothing is complete. Um, so this is the way I look at our family. Um, this one person is missing, so our family is incomplete. We want him back. I still feel he's out there. I want to see him very badly. And if Clifford is watching, come home, my boy. I love you. There is one surprising piece of evidence which seems to support Frances Sherwood's conviction that her son may still be alive. A driver's license record for a man named Edward Clifford Sherwood of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Even though the first and middle names were reversed, the date of birth was identical to Clifford's, March 30th, 1945. However, when investigators tried to find the man, he had moved without leaving a forwarding address. Using the last known photograph of Clifford Sherwood and pictures of his father and other family members, the Toronto Police Department has produced this computerized reconstruction of what Clifford might look like today. He would be 47 years old and may wear glasses or contact lenses. If you have any information about this story, please write to Unsolved Mysteries, Post Office Box 11449, Burbank, California, 91510-1449. You need not give your name. 